ostensibly, Paul writes to Philemon and he says, just receive this slave back the way you've received me because this guy's been converted in Rome with me where I'm a prisoner. Okay? What's that doing in the Bible? What's that book doing in the Bible? If that's what this is about, what's it doing there? It's got no right to do. It's just a letter from one blog to another blog asking a favour, isn't it? It's in the Bible for a reason. And what's the Bible for? You know, all scripture is God breathed, right? And it's God breathed for a reason so that it can be useful for, for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. So that's what it's there for. So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. How is Paul writing to Philemon about Onesimus going to equip us for every good work? Pretty straightforwardly. Because what that letter does is it opens a window on the way things were in the early church, the way things were between the early believers, and it shows us what pattern the church existed in those early days when the doctrine was fresh, when the events were fresh in everybody's mind, when the Spirit was powerfully upon them. It shows us a church, how a church works in the plan and purpose of God when it's going all right. Now, in going perfect, because the church that he writes to, the church that meets in Philemon's house, is in Colossae. And we know there were problems in the church in Colossae because he writes Colossians for that reason. Probably sends this letter along with Colossians at the time. There's tons that's wrong, but there's this that's good about it, and there's this that needs to be emulated, done by us to please God. And this is written for our teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that we, the people of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work that God wants us to do. And it does that by opening this window for opening the window on the early church, specifically in this passage, three things that are true about Philemon and Paul, three things that are true about believers, and then three things to go and do. So far in this letter, there have been no imperatives. An imperative is a verbal form that tells you to go and do something. Yeah? And all of a sudden, and it's really striking, there have been none until verse 17. And all of a sudden, in verses 17 to 20, it's bang, bang, bang. Do this, do this, do this. Are you with me? So it's pretty striking. But those three things to do arise out of three things that we are in the passage. Describing what we are to one another, what we are together in the goodness of God. Okay, Paul has been showing us a dynamic, no way perfect early church. An awful lot that's really good about it though. And we've noticed some core values and we've noticed some emphasis and some ways of doing things. This is how they roll. So in the first three verses we notice an emphasis on apostolic ministry. Apostolic teams going around, kicking things off, planting churches, setting churches up, putting them in, in the way of doing things. An emphasis on apostolic teams. An emphasis on suffering and persecution because they were seeking God's kingdom first. And that gets you in trouble with the kingdoms of men. Right? Yeah, suffering's part of the deal. We follow a suffering saviour. Man, I'm stuck it up, let's get on with it. Shared ministry. Because all around the ages of these apostolic teams, people were coming in and going out. They were coming in, learning, doing, working together, and they were spinning off the edge. Like, like a, did you see that pushover try? Yeah, did, did you see it against Argentina yesterday? Tremendous rolling rock, wasn't it? And they, did you see the way they moved it out? And they moved it back this way, and they went straight through, and somebody at the back had a ball, and he went down with it, and he scored. Yeah? The churches are rolling rock, and people moving and peeling off and drawing men with them. Yeah? Shared ministry. Apostolic teams, persecution, shared ministry, house churches, church in the home. Have you caught up with this while you've been away? Did you catch up? That first one's worth a watch, okay? Or listen to. There's an MP3 of it as well. Fantastic. Um, you can listen to it. Yeah? House churches, this is how they rolled. It's weird, biblically, for a church to have a building. It's weird. It's all family in a home. Incredible stuff. And then the big deal, the whole operation was run right through with the grace of God. Like the writing goes through the skin of rock. Yeah? Run through with the grace of God so the responses we make to one another, so the decisions, the habits, they're shot through with grace. Leading to graciousness. Because that's how our minds work now. We're not working on the basis of tit for tat. We're not working on the basis of your quid pro quo, you know, give that to me, I'll do this for you. We're working on the basis of the outstanding, outrageous grace of God to sinners who had no 
no reason to claim anything, no right to ask for anything. So that was the first week, sorry, <laughs> nearly had a recap of the sermon there again, but we did. Those are the core values that are there. And then we notice in verse, verses 4 to 7, the second time we looked at this, that the love for God's people and faith in the Lord Jesus just characterised these guys. What were they about? They were about love for God's people first. What? Huh? And then faith in the Lord Jesus, because it takes faith to do that, to love God's people, because they don't give you back what you deserve. They give you back very often what you don't deserve. They often give you back nothing. But, but you need the faith to persist in giving them that love, because Christ persists in giving his love for you. To be a Christian community. Paul is appealing them to them on the basis of what's true about Philemon. That, you know, there's this tremendous love for God's people. There's this faith in the Lord Jesus characterising these guys. And Paul is, is then appealing for them to really practice their fellowship in the gospel together, to be a Christian community, to share their faith with one another. And we saw that it works two ways. It's, it's kind of ambiguous and it's covering two bases. It's covering, uh, I pray that, pray that you may be active in sharing your faith together. And that's what empowers sharing your faith with the people out there. Because when they see the, the love of the believers, they'll know we're Christians by our love. Right? When they see that community happening together, that's the most powerful apologetic you can have for the gospel. They'll see it's real. They know it's real when they see that. Then last time, in verses 8 to 16, we looked at the basis of Paul's appeal to Philemon. The love, the gospel of grace that put it to Philemon. The power of Paul's appeal. The content of Paul's appeal. Paul was basically appealing to Philemon to do something on the basis of the grace of God. To act and to behave like a person who had been utterly impacted by the Spirit of God and remade along the lines where not law and entitlement and just deserts decide why we're going to do things, but the unmerited favour of God decides why we're going to do things. Is that making sense? I'm not making sense. Throw a brick or something. No, no, I'm pushing it. Better. Throw something at me if you're not getting this, because this is fundamental. It looks like a letter that's written from one guy to another guy asking for a favour. But frankly, it's so run through with what makes the early church tick and what the gospel will make us, the tune the gospel will make us tick to if the gospel is powerful in us. Now this time, we're coming closer with that orbit on. <laughs> this time, there are those three things that we are and three things that we must do because of it. Firstly, says Paul, we're part of this. We're in this together. We're partners doing something together. If you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. The partners in this. This guy, this Onesimus, this, this renegade slave who's done a runner with your dosh, right? He's your brother. Pray you're now working together. You hate him, right? He's just a, he's just a complete waste of time. He's, he's nicked off with your cash. Okay? Yeah, we're in the partners together. You're now working together, you're now yoked together, pulling this. Send me a partner, welcome him as you welcome me because we're partners in this. Partners. Paul is hammering away at this theme of partnership and sharing and community. And, and Philemon is going to have to welcome Onesimus, the renegade slave, as an actively sharing, fellowshipping partner. Because Paul is an actively fellowshipping partner with a pair of them. And both of them, and Paul as well, are in fellowship, are in partnership with the living God in the work of the kingdom. We're in this together because we're in this with God. We have fellowship with the Father and with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're partners in this. Here's fundamentally what we are. The first thing says Paul. Our sins have been forgiven. We're therefore reconciled to God so that our fellowship with Him is restored. And we are therefore partners with Him and therefore with a whole lot of other seemingly unacceptable people who've spent their lives up until now wronging and being wronged, possibly doing that to me. And God has taken you as you are, and he's, he's sucked up all the things that go on with you that are rubbish, and got on with it. He's made you a partner with him, in spite of you. And because he has, so must you follow him and accept those who are unacceptable, and get on in partnership, working together. Tough stuff, isn't it, Bible? 
by virtue of Christ's sin atoning death on the cross, by virtue of his application of his saving grace to us, unacceptable, offending people, by the miracle working power of the Spirit of God, who has got hold of us and applied all that truth and made it real in us. Both things, the propositional truth and the personal experience of its reality, by virtue of these things, Philemon, Onesimus and Paul are all partners, along with the rest of us, in the cause of the kingdom of God. And that leads to condition and control the way we respond and react to one another. We're in this together. We're partners in this. And that leads to be the ethos of the fellowship that Paul was praying they cheer in verse 6. And that is both the context in which church happens and the best possible apologetic for gospel truth. We're in this together. The functioning community of the people of God working on something together. We spotted years ago that if you want to get guys involved in church, it's easy to get women to come. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Within certain limits. But guys particularly respond to a work day. You can get guys along if you're doing something. If you're building a bus shuttle for charity. I don't know. Something daft maybe, but guys like that particularly. I think ladies like it as well. There's this partnership going on. It's appealing to the world around us to be together in something. Did you see that? Now look. They're looking for that. They're looking to see that reality of that partnership. I just wonder sometimes about all these good conversations we have, because we do, we have some good conversations with people. As a church, we're pretty missional. We're pretty good at talking to people about the Lord Jesus. I know that, because I hear of it, and because we come in here on a Sunday, and people are telling me all the time, and I'm sharing, and you're sharing, these conversations we've had with guys, and please pray for my friend such and such, you know, I've had this conversation about the Lord. We have such good conversations, and that is brilliant. Let's face it, there's a lot of places you could be this Sunday, and that wouldn't be true of us. Okay? It's true of us here. We have a lot of good conversations with people. But, but, you know, I, for myself, speaking for myself, I can give you a list of good conversations, stunning in a few cases. I've had this week with some unpromising seeming individuals in some unpromising places. It's been great. But, I can have so many good conversations. I can talk about grace. I can show where and how it was paid for at Calvary. I can explain where this truth impacts a particular individual's life and troubles. But outside the community of God's people, apart from the fellowship of the Spirit, so often it just seems like a dialogue with the deaf. Because it isn't real. Do you know what I mean? They can't see it happening. God has made us partners in Christ. God has made us partners with the Spirit. God has made us partners with one another in God's church. That is powerful stuff. How did that happen? Would, would we normally be you know, working together on something? Do you know, I've got to tell you this. Me and him, we got this print the other day. With Stone. I was so glad about it. Well, he's good at it. That's what I like. And, and we built this thing together. And it was, it was good. It was good to be working on it together. <laughs> you know, you know your partner's in life, my dear. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to marry him, but I'll build a place with him. <laughs> There's this whole thing the church is, and, and therefore needs to be, working together to give Jesus glory. A powerful testimony to an alienated and an unreconciled world. We've been reconciled to God, so we're reconciled to one another, so we're partners together in this. First thing he says we are, we're partners it arises from who we are, says Paul, but it must permeate the way we behave. If you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. He is the unwelcome one. He's the runaway slave who's next to mine. So we're partners. Second thing we are is brothers. I'm rushing along, I'm leaving stuff out. You're grateful? Good. <laughs> the second thing we are here is brothers. Now, brothers do fight, don't they? Is that fair? Brothers do fight. Brothers fall out between themselves sometimes. Brothers are not always what brothers ought to be. But if Ben needs help, David stands in for him. David needs help, Ben stands in for him. And if Caleb needs help, they're both there. They're there for him. In 
different countries. In different countries, but our Skype is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Did you know this year that the Welsh Rugby Union had a writer in residence? Did you know that? Through the last year, the last 12 months, the Welsh Rugby Union have had a writer in residence. Now, that was a surprise to me when I discovered that was the case. But it's very interesting because he was getting interviewed on Radio 4 uh, Saturday morning. And he's done this in other places. He's done this with, with soldiers in you know, regiments and, and op operational units. And he was comparing this, this writer. He was comparing the experience of soldiers and rugby players and the way they thought and spoke about, you know, putting their bodies on the line, basically. And he spoke about what they said about what motivated them in sport and in combat. And it was all about fighting for the man to the right of you and the man to the left of you. One queen in country. Who was your mates? You're fighting for your brothers. And he said he'd been stunned by the way that the men in both contexts spoke about doing this out of love. It was the bond with their mates that was motivating them to those exertions. Philemon says, Paul, we're side by side, we're shoulder to shoulder, life on the line for the Lord. Brother, back me up. Now, in that sort of context, you know, if your brother calls for help, you will do all sorts of things. You will do outstanding things. Brother, says Paul, I've run into enemy territory. I've got hold of this sin wounded Onesimus, under fire from the enemy of souls, locked up in prison. He became my son while I was still in chains, says Paul. He's still chained to a wall. And it's as if Paul said, I'm puffing and panting, I need, I need you to help me get him back. Let's get him safe into the bastion of God's church, whether in Colossae or in Rome. Get out here, under fire, and drag him back into safety with me and the people of God. He's your brother now. I do wish, verse 20, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. You, Philemon, are a great one for refreshing the hearts of the saints. Paul said that in verse 7. You, Philemon, know that Onesimus is my heart, says Paul, verse 12. So how about refreshing my heart, says Paul? Come on, brother. Refresh my heart. Refresh my heart. Um, hang on. What's going on? Good question here. Yeah? Whose heart is going to get refreshed? Hmm. Philemon refreshes the hearts of the saints. Paul's heart is an essence, he says, in verse 12. And I've just sent him back to you. Character or Onesimus has rotten Philemon has escaped, probably on stolen money, he's carried him the 1600 miles or so to Rome where he's met Paul and been converted. Onesimus is now doing what scripture commands from at least Deuteronomy onwards and trying to make good, trying to repent means make good what you've done. It's coming back to you to make restitution to Philemon. But since Deuteronomy, we've had the gospel, we've had the gospels, and specifically we've had Luke chapter 15. How does God, the father in the parable of the lost sons, how does he deal with the wayward son and comes home? He refreshes him. <laughs> he gives him a robe and a ring and sandals and a good meal. A party with his friends that refreshes his heart. Well, even this is how God has received How now will you receive back an essence? Who gets refreshed? Refresh me. Refresh my brother. Here's my heart. Refresh my heart, but here's my heart coming back to you. Who gets refreshed? If if Philemon refreshes Onesimus the way the Father refreshes the Son who returns in Luke 15, whose heart's going to be refreshed? Mine says Paul. I'm going to be busted. I'm going to be busted. Would you do that for me? Refresh my heart in Christ, says Paul. You are a refresher. Do it for me. Three things we are, partners, brothers, refreshers. We're to refresh the hearts of the saints. Now here's an aspect of ecclesiology you don't hear so much of. 
I remember years ago in a previous church, uh, our, our first soul charge, it hit me quite hard on Sunday morning, realizing that our people were coming in on Sundays having had a hard week. And all the stuff I've learned because of the way I've been trained, the people I'm mixing with, whatever, you know, Sunday sermons have to be. I remember meeting a guy, an older preacher in a Christian bookshop um, uh, from not far away. He was from a church not, far, not that far away. And he said, Oh, my sermon, as if it was a good thing, he said, Oh, my sermons, they bury people. I was thinking, they probably do, mate, yeah. <laughs> Kill me off anyway, you know? As if it was a good thing. And realizing that those people were coming in there from lives that had been hit and battered and shattered, and they needed their souls not to be redeemed, that was done, but they needed their hearts to be refreshed. How's that going to happen? Well, Philemon's a big one for us. You, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. This is what we are for one another, partners. 